Yeah, no, no, that's all right. Um, that's a virtual reality camera I just turned on, and so this part of this lecture will eventually go up on YouTube. I'm sharing this with the folks that are going to be watching via Twitter. Okay, so <coughs> we have, yeah, it's very fish eye. I was huge, you were tiny. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so there we go. What I want to do is go through three basic classes of devices that people will be using to explore virtual reality. And there are certain classes of apps that will be associated with each of these. John, this is when we can start handing things around now. Okay, so we're going to start with the Google Cardboard, and we've got two of those, actually three of those. Oh, it's still going. Yeah, it's still going. Um, so the basic innovation here at the Google I.O. event in 2014, they announced something that was basically a cardboard with two pieces of plastic lenses that would fit directly over a smartphone. And as long as the smartphone is reasonably powerful and equipped with an accelerometer, which John's phone is not, um, then what you can do is you can create the side-by-side -side stereo projection for a virtual world, and you can put this head mount on, and for about $3 in parts, you can create reasonably effective virtual reality. No, 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 not yet, that's coming up next. Now, if you want to go a little higher, you can go over to Target, and you can spend 40 bucks. Can you get this? So did you all have Viewmasters when you were kids? Well, this is the Viewmaster VR. All right, and so it works just like a cardboard. There's some very specific Viewmaster content. I've actually loaded up in here an immersive film that I'll be talking about in a minute. And the actual Viewmaster content is kind of expensive. Yeah, the Viewmaster actual content is, is quite expensive. Now, all of those systems that you're playing with have associated with them something that we call three degrees of freedom, all right, which means that they will detect yawing, so they'll detect you as you spin around, They'll detect you as you pitch, as you look up, and they'll detect you as you roll, because it's still in your head. So you all pitch and roll are the three degrees of freedom known as the axes of orientation. So that means that as you move your head around in the virtual world, the images will all follow you. Now, these devices have shipped in vast numbers. As of January this year, over 5 million of them had shipped. Now, when you think that there's probably around a billion smartphones out there in the world that are capable of using this kind of technology, you can see this is really just starting to scratch the surface. We haven't even gotten to 1% of the overall market capacity having these devices. But last year, the New York Times shipped one of these to every one of their subscribers for either print or for digital editions because the New York Times is now starting to produce content that's being delivered over the cardboard. So they're starting to produce what you might think of as immersive or 360 degree documentaries. The primary sort of thing that we're going to see in the cardboard level devices, because they're inexpensive, are content marketing. It's going to be someone who's created content because they want to sell you something. They want to sell you a magazine subscription. They want to sell you a product, whatever it might be. And so what you're going to see is a vast proliferation of these devices and a vast amount of content marketing created content for these devices that will be sponsored in some way to be able to give a brand better representation. This is probably not going to be an enormous platform for gaming. There, is some, there are some games that are available for this. But I think that this is market is going to be much more around the creation of branded content. OK. So you pop up a level. And you get to this. So this is the Gear VR. All right, there we go. OK, I'm going to pass this around. Please be a little delicate with this. This one is not $3. This one is $150, but requires a $1,000 smartphone, a specific model Samsung smartphone to work with it. And I just want you to have a look in, because what I want you to see very specifically is what you might call the home space for this virtual world. It is a store, as you might expect. It's the equivalent, in a sense, of iTunes. There's a little dial on the top that if you need to adjust it to fit your eyes, you can, you can do that. So there's this idea that when you get up this level, so you have this device that all told cost about $1,000, that you now have the capacity to be able to sell people apps. And so you 
have an app store called Jig. And so people are creating games, people are creating pieces of cinema, they're creating tutorials, whatever they're creating, but they're creating bits of VR content that are very soon. Now the big difference between this and a cardboard is that the plastic mount that the phone is sitting in is equipped with very high precision sensors. So when you use a cardboard and you move your head around, you can sort of tell that there's a bit of a delay between when you move your head around and when the image moves. That's not because your mobile phone is slow, it's because the sensors that detect the orientation of your phone were designed for someone who was flipping the phone around, going between one form of orientation and another, between portrait and landscape. They didn't need to be fast. When you're using virtual reality, if those sensors aren't fast, they produce a kind of motion sickness. This motion sickness, and this is very important to understand, is because of a conflict between your perception, that is what your eyes are seeing, and your proprioception, that is what your inner ear is experiencing, or what your joints are experiencing. And when there's a big variance between your perception and your proprioception, your body thinks it has eaten a poison and does the thing that is most natural when your body thinks it's been poisoned, which is to make you vomit. Now, anecdotally, women are much more sensitive to this kind of motion sickness than men. There's no firm evidence there, but the anecdotal story are that women actually have a much more fine-tuned sense of this difference between proprioceptive and perception senses than men do. And so there's an open question now about whether the design of current generation VR systems aren't in fact enforcing a kind of gender boundary. We don't know this, but it's a question that needs to be asked there. And um, there's a specific app in Gear VR called Titan Explorer, which takes you on a beautiful trip around the solar system and you're floating above the planets and the moons and all of this. And I used this a couple of weeks ago as I was running through all the demos that I wanted to talk about today. And I'm sitting and I'm looking down and they give you a virtual body. So you look down and you kind of see your virtual, by the way, male body, but you, you see your virtual body. Um, and you're sitting on this sort of chair as you're floating throughout the galaxy or floating throughout space. And they really do make it feel as though the galaxy is floating by, the stars are whizzing by, and you have this amazing feeling of motion. And I kept this up for about four minutes, and then I realized that I was about to puke. Because there was this enormous disagreement between what my body knew was the case and what my eyes were telling my body should be the case. And so this now becomes a design point, because in fact, it's now really easy for a badly designed immersive environment to make someone physically ill. And for the next couple of years, we're going to see all these examples of someone who pushed the pedal to the metal and only ended up making most of the audience sick. OK. Again, that's a three degree of freedom system. So it's got your audition role. All right. Now we have what we might call the professional class systems. The one up here, this is the Oculus Rift. The Oculus Rift just started shipping in the last week. Um, Oculus was a Kickstarter project that was purchased by Facebook two years ago. Now has a lot of money behind it, a lot of energy behind it. And it is a six degree of freedom system. So that means that not just the all kitchen roll, but movement in space, translation in space. And so we're now entering what we call room-scale virtual reality. Now, room-scale virtual reality presents itself as a qualitatively different experience because it's not just you looking around this world or being propelled around this world on some sort of track. It's a world that you are now fully capable of exploring while fully embodied. So although you're in another place, your body is in that other place with you. And your body's there because you're using those sensors. I figure, what did the Facebook ones called, John? Do you remember? OK. So the Facebook sensors, and uh, this is the HTC Vive. This, this system will be shipping next month. I actually have this on order right now, so I'm waiting very patiently for it to arrive. Um, this is going to be, so these are both room scale VR systems. They're quite expensive because the systems themselves in Australian dollars are over 1,000 Australian dollars but they also need to be connected to a two or $3,000 computer because the computer has to be very, very high-end in terms of its capacity to create high 
gen um, high frame rate computer graphics, so 90 frames per second. This is done in order to keep people from getting motion sick because you can have the head tracking be as smooth, and you saw how smooth it was on the Gear VR, if you're using the Gear VR right now. You can see how smooth the head tracking is. And then of course, there's the Sony PS VR, which when you add up all the components will cost about $1,100 So that's not cheap, it's much cheaper than the others. This one will ship in October. Now to give you an idea of what's about to happen here, those two systems, if we're lucky this year, will probably ship 100,000 units a piece. That system will probably ship a million units on the first day. And so all of a sudden what we're going to see is there's going to be an enormous push towards the design and implementation of games for virtual worlds because that's what the PlayStation VR is going to be fundamentally geared around. But in fact, games are probably the least interesting application for virtual reality. I'm going to show you some other things. Now, here's an app that was released just this morning called Tilt Brush. You all know what Photoshop is, right? Well, this is Photoshop for virtual reality. So again, if you're on Steam, you can download that today. If you really do need a uh, virtual reality system to use it. But it was released this morning. I think it's like 30 bucks. Um, already, people are claiming that this is the killer app for the room-scale virtual reality systems. And having used it, used it, I can only agree with them. All right. So let's talk about the different classes of applications that we're going to start to see emerging with pervasive VR systems. Mm -hmm. So the first one of these we want to talk about is immersive cinema. So this is using something similar to this kind of camera, let's say. I don't want to 